34. We're going to look at a few verses in the middle of the psalm, but I want to first present this thought that someone once said that inside of all of us, there is a God-sized hole. What they're trying to explain in a maybe human rationale is that God has made every single person with an innate understanding that there is an emptiness that can only be filled by God himself, a God-sized hole. We attempt to fill this hole with so many other activities and delights in our life. Yet all of these things that we try to fill that hole with will leave us feeling uh, empty and worthless, dissatisfied, disillusioned, defenseless, wanting, unfulfilled, will feel purposeless. And ultimately what has happened is we're trying to fill that God-sized hole that is in every single person with something else. And yet in this passage of Scripture, we find out that God wants to fill that void, that hole in all of us in a unique and a special way. Even after salvation, there are Christians who want to obtain what God offers through their own methods. Right, So perhaps there is deliverance that's needed and the deliverance in that Christian's life doesn't look like God, it looks like overtime. Because the God-sized whole says, put your faith in me and yet I'm guilty, we're guilty, you and I are guilty of, wait a second, I need deliverance and rather than plug God in, I plug the overtime in. Rather than find satisfaction in God... We say, well, when I have this meaningful relationship, that'll plug that hole. And it may be my friendships even at church with godly individuals. It may be, unfortunately, through social media and say, boy, when I hit 1,000 and 2,000 friends, then I'll find meaning and purpose. But they're trying to fill a hole that God wants to fill with a meaningful relationship through external relationships. Again, trying to fill a God-sized hole, a God-ordained hole, outside of God's directives. Satisfaction and contentment in life is not sought at first by the word of God and his way. We try to find contentment through the accumulation of things. And we have garages and barns and houses full of things that promise to bring contentment. And even at a young age, we find that you see an advertisement and you're like, I can't wait till I have that toy. And that toy at four and five, then I'll be happy. And, and at four and five, we get that toy. And, and then we find out, oh, you know what? It was, it was cheaper than I imagined. Remember when my kids were younger, we'd finished working a, a job and they had some money to spend. And they saw these robots. All right, they're from Star Wars. They were called the BB-8. So these little round robots. And they were radio controls. All right, and they were like, the advertisement for them and the reviews for everything, they were like amazing. Voice controlled. All right? And I remember my kids, they were young, and they're like, this is it. Like once we get this BB-8 robot, life cannot get any better than this. Right? And, and, and lest, we, lest we joke and laugh at the thought, the thought process of children, Men, we do it with trucks or guns or hunting and women with a deal. Like, we all have the same draw inside of us, okay? So we can easily point in front of my children because I do all the time, and so I'm happy with this. But the BB-8, that was a solution. And then they showed up at the house. And they're like, Dad, these are awesome. All right, now the first problem came when all the kids have them and the radio signals started to cross paths with each other. So utter chaos ensued in the house. So Dad... You know, obviously, Dad of the Year had the best idea. Let's go to the church in the gymnasium. Like, drive these things around the church and on the hallways. Like, this is like... So we came over here. We're driving these things and boom, hitting a wall. And they're cracking here and cracking there. And, like, these things were amazing toys for, like, an hour. If that. And then it was like, ah, we're done. Now, parents with small children, that story can be repeated. Can it not be? You buy them this huge present, and they're like, look at the box. <laughs> this box is amazing. You find them sitting in a box. You're like, really? I, I, I did all this for a box? Yet it's the same thing that happens in your life and in my life, if we're not careful. We, we feel that God-sized need, that, that hole, and we begin to taste and devour all these things that we think will satisfy, 
fill that need, bring contentment and delight, and yet we end up being meaningless and purposelessness and have purposelessness in our lives. No ambition and no goals. Family time trumps worship time. Because somehow we think time with family is more important than time with the Heavenly Father. Self elevates over God. Because we strangely think that I can do a better job than God can. There's no seeking what God wants. It's merely living like I feel. We dress the way we feel. We spend time the way we feel. We add Christian service when it's convenient. We are partial followers. And our hole is partially filled, but without commitment, dependency, and obedience, or trust. This, if I can, this religious experience that I describe is contrary and opposite of what the Word of God shows us here in this passage. Because this religious experience will always leave us with a sour taste in our heart and emptiness in our soul. Yet God, in Psalm 34, seeks to show us that the Lord is sufficient, satisfactory. He is delightful to those who trust in him. So with that kind of background in mind, let us read Psalm 34, verses 4 through 10, and then we'll unpack them very quickly this afternoon. David, of course, in the cave of Abimelech, I'm sorry, Adullam, after leaving Abimelech, writes these words. Beginning verse number 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Lord, as we look at this passage of scripture, I pray you'd help us. Lord, instruct us and change us. Lord, reveal to us ways that we have latched onto and been partakers of, of things that will not bring your satisfaction, your contentment, and your joy. Lord, help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is sufficient. The Lord is good. The Lord is delightful to those who trust in him. I think the crux of this passage is found in verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is, and what's the word? He's good. He is good. And anyone who has tasted of God will tell you he is good. And, and the Bible tells us that blessed is the man that trusted in him. I believe that verse is kind of the key for this passage, verses 4 through 10. In reality, what we do is we trade, we trade real food for baby food. Does baby food bring any kind of nutrition? Well, sure, on a small scale it does. Is it satisfaction? Not today. Not today. He said, listen, for faith-building offering, we're going to have jars of baby food, and you can have as much as you want. Pastor Scott will place them at your table. He'll bring seconds and thirds and fourths around as much baby food as you want. I don't think there's anyone in this room who would be like, who has a, a knowledge of this, who would be like, this is awesome. Best faith building ever. Baby food. I hope I get the peas. They were my favorite. It was what, a few months ago, Jackie? I was at your house, and, and uh, you're feeding your son, forcing him to eat that, that terrible baby food. And I thought, boy, you're never going to be mother of the year to force your child to eat baby food. All right, now what God wants is not for us to partake of baby food, but of, re of real food. It is like eating saltines when you can have a fresh loaf of bread straight from the oven of the Word of God. It is like eating Tootsie Roll Pops, which someone will probably eat today, when instead you could have chocolate chip cookies that are warm, or fresh apple pie a la mode, or vanilla cheesecake, and instead you trade it for a Tootsie Roll Pop. It is like having a McDonald's hamburger when you could have a steak from a high-end steakhouse. It is this trade that we make when we don't look to God to fill that need. Four ways in this passage, four attributes, four sufficiency we find when we trust in him. The first one is found in verse 4 and 5. 
And the Bible says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. You'll notice in this passage, there are a number of times it says all or, or every. Or there's, a, there's a, 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 an encompassing of this verbiage in these words that God is more than sufficient. They looked into him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. The first thought is this, that I find, we find sufficient answers when we trust in God. He says, I sought the Lord and he heard me. My friends, I can tell you right now, when you seek God's face, he hears you and he answers. And it's not just partial answers. It's not just small answers. God brings sufficient answers. He brings satisfying answers. He brings delightful answers. Oh, taste and see that he is good. And in our answers to our prayers, we find from this passage that God not only hears, he delivers that God, when I call, God answers me. The Bible is replete with verses, commands of examples of what occurs when one calls out to God from the early pages of Nehemiah when he's standing before the king and he utters a simple prayer from his heart that in essence says, God help me, grant me grace, and God answers. To the desperate cry from Peter, walking on water, he begins to sink. He cries out to God and God graciously reaches out and answers. The Bible is filled, it's replete. That when we call out to God, we find his sufficient answers. And the reason often we don't find sufficient answers is because we don't call out to God. We call out to Almighty Google, to the great YouTube, to the lifeline phone a friend, to the deceitfulness of our own heart and mind, and we wonder why God doesn't answer our prayers because we've really not made any. We've tacked him on to the end and said, God, now that I've exhausted all of my resources and all of my lifelines and all of my searches, Google and YouTube, everything, now that I've done all of that and all, the, all my ways have not worked out, God, now I suppose you can weigh in on the conversation. And yet we find from this passage, David reminds us that when I called unto God, when I trusted in him, I found out that God brings sufficient answers to prayers. If we had the time, we could go through this room today and you could tell me about answers to prayers. Times you prayed specifically, old and young, rich and poor, saved for a long time, saved for a little bit, where you said, I, I prayed and God answered this way. God brought this in my life. God answered this way. He delivered from this problem. God brings sufficient answers when I trust in him. But look at verse number nine, if you would, please. The second sufficiency of God we find where the Bible says, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. Now, I don't do, not only do I find sufficient answers, but I find sufficient supply when I trust in him. When I depend upon God, I find no deficiency. There's no deficiency lacking. No need is lacking. Now, you will say to me, if you're honest, you know what, there are sometimes I feel like God didn't meet one of my needs. The issue is that God promises to meet all of my needs. So if something is not met, it must not be a need. And I can get confused in my life. You can get confused in your life between needs and wants. There are some times that I need something really badly, but I don't really need it, do I? And God promises to supply my needs. He doesn't promise to supply my almost needs. Lord, I got a problem coming up next week. Save me from it. God never promises grace for almost needs. He said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What God is saying is, listen, you got enough to worry about in the next three minutes? And don't worry about three weeks from now. You and I aren't made that way. Yet we see these almost needs. We're like, God, you didn't meet that almost need. Or, whew, barely, you know, dodged a bullet there. No, 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 God promises. And we're reminded in this passage that when we, when we trust him and fear him, that there is a sufficient supply. As a father... I feel it's my obligation, and I love to do it, take care of my children. I love providing for their needs. They're typically grateful as children. Sometimes they're not, but typically grateful. And I doesn't, it doesn't bother me when they come and say, Dad, you know what? My shoes don't fit any longer. My boys are growing right now, and they're outgrowing their shoes, and I'm like, okay, well, we got to get new shoes, right? And normally as a father, and many of fathers and parents the same way, you try to to do nice gifts for your children, do you not? But provide the best you can with inside of parameters and resources that you have. And, and I am 
a poor example of our Heavenly Father who loves to give good gifts to his children. And that's what the Bible says. In soccer cleats, I don't mind buying expensive cleats on sale and, and good deals. Lunch money. Lunch money. Kids eat. Kids eat. I've told the story before, but I remember growing up, I had an older sister, or a second mother if she's watching. I should send her a Mother's Day card. Thank you for being such a great influence in my life. Well, she'd probably <laughs> kill me. Uh, I felt like this with my parents, that was not true, but it felt this way, right? I'd go to my dad, hey, dad, I need money for lunch. He'd hand me three quarters and say, bring me back the change from lunch. My sister, same house, different gender, perhaps more responsible, but not in my mind. Hey, dad, need money for lunch. Hey, here's a 50, keep the change. Right now, it wasn't true. My dad was dinner with both of us, but, but as a kid, you feel that way. But the fact is, hey, I try to take care of my children, and I'm a poor example of our Heavenly Father. We find out when we trust in Him that there's sufficient supply. Not only is, is there sufficient answers and sufficient supply, but there is sufficient protection when I trust in Him. Verse number 6, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. It's like that when I trust in God, the Lord pulls up the bus and sits outside the house. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. It's like that I've got, when I'm trusting in God, I've got a guard on duty who is supernatural in his ability who is unmatched in the universe, and who stops everything before it gets to my front door. That's the angel of the Lord in camp with round about them that fear him and delivereth them. You see, there is sufficient protection, sufficient deliverance when I trust in God. Nothing can touch me. Nothing can harm me. Nothing happens in my life unless God ordains it or allows it. Because the angel of the Lord in campeth sets up his habitation round about them, his fortress, his walls. Nothing can get in when God is my protection. There is a possessiveness there, and it's sufficient. He's better than any gun. He's better than any gun. And you can get your house all set for the next apocalypse, but God's better than any gun. He's better than any 401k. He's better than any wall or moat or drawbridge. God is the great protector. He is sufficient. And I find in this passage that God is sufficient in answers when I trust him. He's su sufficient in supply. And he's sufficient in deliverance. But last, look at verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. See, ultimately, we find out that when I trust in God we find out that God himself is sufficient. That God himself is delicious, if I can. That God himself is delightful. That God is satisfaction. That God is contentment. That God is pleasing to interact with. That God is pleasing to partake from. That God, I can taste and see, and I will never be disappointed. It was years ago that we were on a mission trip. I'm here from First Baptist Church, my wife and I and the young people. We had a Tim Hortons up in Canada. Now, Canada is the birthplace of Tim Hortons. In fact, uh, Emily, uh, um, the young lady who's married to Matt here, she is from, they worked in a place in Hamilton, Ontario, which is the birthplace of Tim Hortons. I went to the first Tim Hortons, there's a big sign there. I don't believe it was that Tim Hortons, but it was a Tim Hortons in Canada. We were there late at night after a full day of calling and interacting with young people. My wife was, thirst, was thirsty, so she asked for a container of milk. Now, I don't drink a lot of milk uh, from stores and restaurants, but at that time, the milk was, was in those little containers that you had to, like, you had to like break it, and then you like pull it forward, and it formed like a little triangle part. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Like a little, I don't know if they still make it that way. You know, now I get milk in jugs. So she asked for a little one. They, they brought her one. She opened this container up. And it was thirsty, she was tired. She took just a big old swig of this container. And the milk was bad. It didn't come out in liquid form, it came out in chunk form. I still, 
I don't ever want to experience this. This sounds terrible. I know that when I talked about Diet Coke, I got Diet Dr. Pepper. Please don't bring me spoiled milk for, for the pulpit. <laughs> All right. I, there's no delight in this. <laughs> so she, she opened this thing and drank it, and it was instant revulsion. And she's like, you know, and, I mean, you know, and then I had to smell it, looked at it, smelled it. And it's like she pours a little bit, it's like clump, clump, clump. I mean, just disgusting. It smelled spoiled. It was spoiled. And she was... Like, for a while, um, tainted toward milk, as we all would be, right? And every time she went to drink some milk after that for a little while, it was like, is this one bad? Like a little sip. Now, I can tell you with confidence from the Word of God that no one who has cracked open God, if I can, if I can explain it that way, and taken a big sip has ever found him to be spoiled are disappointed. In fact, the Bible says, oh, taste and see that he's good. And he is sufficient. And he is delightful. He is delicious. As I trust in him, I'm blessed. As I trust in him, I find out he's sufficient for answers, for supply, for protection. And I find him to be sufficient. It's fitting words from a man who had some serious faults in his life. From a man who, like I mentioned last week, was often compared to later on in life, from other, or after life, other kings. From a man who, was it said, this is a man who is fashioned and who is formed after God's own heart, who seeks God. David wasn't disappointed. And he clearly tells these family members in this cave, these men who have showed up, who have problems and distresses and debts, that's the ones who showed up in the cave. He said, listen, you taste and see that God is good. And I wonder if as he's speaking this in this cave that afternoon or that evening, if he pointed to a few men. When he said, you, you taste and see that God is good. And you, you taste and see that he's good. And you, you taste. And listen, you've got problems and you have problems, you have problems. I called to God and he heard me. The Lord's going to camp around about us. We're going to trust in him. He's going to deliver us. But when you taste, you're going to find out he is good. He is good. What you find out as you study the scriptures, some of those same men were with David till the end. Till the end. That they never left his side. Some, we look back and they, they, they became, some, I believe, some of the mighty men of David. And somehow along the way, though they were in distress, though they were broken, they got a hold of this idea. And I imagine, I imagine before this they had sought to fill that God-sized hole with everything else. And God says only one way, or David says only one way that you'll find your satisfaction. That's letting God fill that hole in your hard life. Anything else is just a cheap religious experience that'll leave a sour, spoiled taste in your mouth that is disgusting, unfulfilling, and ultimately pushed aside.